Good evening, everyone. We are here again at Devore Truth Church and celebrating Southern California's winter. The high, the high today was 59 and the low was 44. And I know some of you people, Massachusetts, Maine, all those places and across the world are saying, that's summer weather for us. So, yeah, I, I, we have a friend that uh, we, we call, I call him pray with quite a bit that lives in, uh, I think he's moved now, but he was in Butte, Montana. And uh, one time I called him and I, I said, uh, uh, Steve, how, how, what's the weather there? And he said, oh, it's cold. I said, well, how cold? He said, it's 30 below right now. Uh, but now that is with a wind chill factor, but still, 30 below is 30 below, if you've ever lived in those areas. Let, let's pray. Father God, as we come before you tonight, we just ask for your presence, Father, to, to be here and guide us and the Holy Spirit just to love upon us. And, and we thank you that you have sent your son to, to die on the cross for us and that, that to, to forgive us of our sins. And we just uh, bring that to you, Father God, and, and we praise you and say thank you. So we come before you, Father. We want to re repent from anything that uh, maybe we sinned against you on it. Yeah, I know each and individual needs to repent, but I, I just want to bring my life before you, Father God, and say thank you. We love you, Father, and we just praise you for what you do for us. We praise you for your, your, your word you gave us, the, the reading of your words, Father. So tonight as we study your word, as we talk about it, we thank you and we just praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Tonight we're going to be studying in, uh, get my glasses off here. I hate, I hate glasses. I have to take them off to see, put them on to see. So anyway. Uh, last time that I was up here a few weeks ago, we talked about uh, Noah, the days of Noah. And tonight we're going to be in Daniel. And one thing that uh, always has intrigued me with some of these stories, that uh, the story of Daniel, uh, like uh, uh, Jonah and all those, have been told to, to children since as far back as, as I can remember and, and, and everybody too. But they've been... Uh, 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 trivialized and reduced to Bible tales for children, especially when you get into like uh, Jonah, a big fish, and all this stuff. You get into the fiery furnace. If you're going to go to the fiery furnace, little boy, so you better be nice. No, I don't think I ever heard that screamed at me, but probably pretty close. Uh, so we, we do miss the far greater and deeper spiritual meanings of, of these stories, and there are so many, and, and God gave them to us so that we could learn, so that we could pass them on and, and tell about the things that God takes care of us. And this is really what all these stories are about, is that how God takes care of us. We entitled this story tonight, and I say we because my wife, Carol, writes most of this stuff for me and says, here, read this tonight. Oh, she does, and I'm teasing. But she, she wrote, in the fire. So we're going to talk about the fiery furnace. But it's more than the fiery furnace. The whole thing uh, of signs and wonders and miracles is the greater spiritual message behind these. Are the, and that's the most benefit. It's a spiritual message. It's not a kid's thing. It's not a baby thing or a teenager's thing. It's a spiritual message for all of us. And just think, and I always, I'm amazed at this, that all this was written thousands of years ago. Thousands of years ago. I, I, it's, it's hard to even imagine. Daniel's prophetic ministry began and ended in Babylon when Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar first besieged Jerusalem in 605 B.C., 605 years ago before Christ was, was born. So if you think about that, that would have, in, in the times that we can relate to, that was about the time that uh, what uh, uh, Columbus came to America. And look how we've changed in that time between those 600 years. Moses predicted that Israel lost her place of supremacy among the nations because she did not obey God. Instead of being uh, the head, Israel became the tail to be wagged by the Gentiles. And that's in Deuteronomy 28. Israel just gave up and lost her obedience, lost uh, 
anything she was supposed to do to uh, maintain this. Yet because the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, when the fullness of the Gentiles is complete, Israel will be saved. For the Deliverer will come out of Zion and take away Israel's sins. Romans 11, 25, 30. At the end, it all comes out. But it has to be that the Gentiles, what am I trying to say? Uh, it, says, it says the fullness of the Gentiles, which means that they had to do all their, th- all their stuff, that the, that the Israel had to come out, but because uh, of the deliverer. That's what I'm getting at. There had to be somebody that brought them out. And they were the favorite. They were God's favorite people. Why would they have to do that? Well, we're going we're gonna to go more into this. We'll begin in Daniel 1, which portrays an example of believers interacting with others. They are God's witnesses in a pagan land, living in a world, but not of the world. How many times have we heard Jesus uh, say that? I'm of this world, I'm, I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. Remember the old bumper, the, not the bumper stickers. I guess there was bumper stickers, there was everything. What was it, G-something, G, uh, remember that? Uh, what, well, no, but there was a one I'm thinking of, not of this world. The end, the, okay, not of this world. Thank you. My wife is coaching me in the background here, which is good. Always good. To, anyway, uh, the message in Daniel is really about being used by God to reach men's hearts in the end times. In God's, in Daniel's case, as Israel has been taken into captivity by Babylon. We remember Babylon took Israel into captivity. And so for all these years, uh, Babylon has always been noted and always will be noted as sin. No matter what you want to write it, how you want to do it, Babylon could be called sin instead of Babylon. Daniel 1 describes Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the escapade, I guess we would call it that. It wasn't really an escapade because I would think of that being fun. They were taken captive. They were brought to the land of Shinar, the original birthplace of Babylon, and the infamous Tower of Babel. Shinar means shake out, and that's what God did at the Tower of Babel. So they were brought to the house of God. Now, not a big G, but a small G. They were brought to the house of, of God, which uh, was Babylon as, as, they, uh, as it was. Nebuchadnezzar, when he brought them, he brought them for a purpose of them, the captive, captives, of being part of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar gives them a new home, no longer would they have the godly influence of parents or teachers. Back where they come from, back in Israel, they had godly parents. They had teachers that loved the Lord, loved our God, loved him awful, just awesome, awesome, I should say, not awful. So when, when Nebuchadnezzar brought these, these prisoners out, and we're talking about uh, Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he wanted them to have a new home and be part of his as prisoners, as uh, uh, captives. He also wanted them to have new knowledge. They had to learn the wisdom language. They had to learn the wisdom, the language, the culture, and the way of thinking of their captors. So the old, they wanted to brainwash them, in other words. And what, hey, that sounds like the world today. They want to brainwash you. I can think of a few years ago that we weren't allowed to say these, these terms we aren't now, but of all the, the brainwashing that was done, that we had to uh, be pretty strong to stay away from it, and, and that's still carrying on. We just had our elections yesterday, and I won't go into that too much at all, but uh, all, these, all these services, I mean, all these ads on the TV that from all the, everybody, everybody's going to do the greatest job. They want to brainwash you to come into their fold, so to speak. They had a new diet, which would be contrary to the dietary laws provided in the Mosaic law. Now, you would think, oh, that was just food. But this was their 
their uh, part of their their law, their God. They're, this is the think about. Uh, you guys know the dietary laws, especially in this day and age. Oh, you can't eat pork. I mean, and that was what was done back then. Pork is an unclean animal, and it was stated in there that they were not to eat that. So they did have dietary laws. And apparently, going on down here, uh, they had new names. They had God's names within their own names in giving them new names the Babylonians hoped that a kind of spiritual transference into the newly assigned names would make them forget their godly roots. I'm going to read Daniel 1, 8, and 8 to 9. Or do I have it here? No, I don't. Okay, hang on. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice foods. Okay, this is... And I must. I'm, maybe I put something wrong in here. This is what it was. They wanted all these young men captives to come in. They wanted to take all this away. They want to give them a new home. They want to give them everything that that we were reading about here. Uh, they wanted them to have the knowledge of their of their country. They wanted them to have a new diet, which was going to make them strong and be like the Babylonians, whether they wanted to or not. So they. So the king says. Uh, I've got all this choice food for you. Instead of giving you stuff that's good for you, I'm going to give you ribeye steaks. I'm going to give you lamb chops, pork chops. I'm going to give you everything you want. And we're going to drink the best of beverages, the best wine. It would cost you $100 a, a bottle in the store, but it's yours free because it's from the king. And I'm going to do for you everything that you desire to a point. So now let me say, Daniel, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the, of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the, the and the commander of the officials, hang on here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now they were being tested. The message in Daniel really is about being used by God to reach men's hearts in the end times. In Daniel's case, as Israel has been taken into captivity, and, okay, hang on here. So they were brought to the land of Shinar, the original birthplace of Babylon. And the famous Tower of Babel. Shinar, Shinar means stake out, shake out. And that is what God did at the Tower of Babel. So they were brought to the house of God. But the house of God, again, the little G. Now they were being tested. Spiritual tests are not limited to just personal effects, but actually serve as a witness of God to those around us. We, we, we are tested every day like this. Uh, people are watching us. I don't care where you're at. You're in the grocery store. You're, you're in uh, wherever, at a gas station. You're, you're walking at, at work. You're tested every day. How do people, how do people uh, look at you? I'm a Christian. Are you really? God says that you're, you're to be loving to people. God says that you're to be uh, showing people that you care, that, that you are a, uh, a child of God. I, uh, I'm going to say this, and I, and I, and I don't need, want any... Oh, let me say it first, then we'll say it. This Monday, I had a doctor's appointment, and I was told 
that I have a possibility of a blood cancer. Well, that's pretty hard to hear. I don't like that word. That's a hard word to hear. I was told I had a possibility of a blood cancer. Carol and I probably bawled all the way home at our age anyway. When I got home, my battery was dead on my car. So we had to take another car to the doctor. So I called AAA, and they came out, and I had this young man. And I started talking to him, and I started telling him, you know, as an hour ago, I was told I had cancer. And I started ministering to him. I started telling him of the love of God. I started asking him about his own life, and he said he's not a believer. And I wanted to know why. I wanted to talk to him more. So that was a big test for me for that day. And, I'm, and I don't know why I, I brought this. I just don't want people feeling sorry for me because it's just a possibility. There's nothing like that. I just brought it up as saying that no matter what the devil throws at us, we need to get out there and tell others of, his, of God's love. And we need to say, I'm going to tell you about my God no matter what. I've heard people say, oh, how could God do that to me? God doesn't do that to you. The devil does it to you, and you help him. If you buy into it, you help the devil. And I know I'm losing my place here probably big time. My wife is, is cringing at me because she goes, she, she tells me, put your finger there where you're at. Anyway, uh, we have to remember that God isn't the one that causes all this. The, Satan is the person that runs this world. And he runs it for a reason, because he wants to replace our, our Lord and Savior, which he's never going to do. He's never going to get there. Spiritual tests are not limited to their personal effects, but actually serve the witness of God to those who serve as a witness to God that are around us. And I know we talk about this a lot. Marco talks about it. Anthony talks about it. We only serve God, and we have to let other people see that we are serving God. And that's what this is going to be about when we come to the conclusion in this lesson, is serving God, as being a witness, as being a witness. Daniel 1.15 says, at the end of 10 days, which remember they, they just ate, asked for a different diet, and the commander was not real sure that he wasn't going to lose his head over this. But anyway, he granted this for them. And so he and, and they asked, just let us do it for ten days, and we, and we'll see. Because our God is is our God, and He's the only God. At the end of ten days, their appearance seemed better, and they were fatter than all the youth who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food, and the wine that they were to drink, and kept giving them vegetables. First vegetarians, I uh, imagine, but anyway. They, yeah, God gave them the perfect food. You know, uh, as for the four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in the branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. You know, I want to get back to the natural foods. We, in the park on Sundays, we have a, a lady that comes here to Devor that has been with us in the park almost from the beginning. And we were talking about the diet that a lot of the 28-day fast diet or whatever the women are all on here. And the men, too. You can't, you can't have your cook go on a diet without you going on a diet. So we're all there. <laughs> so whether we wanted to or not, but it's very beneficial. Anyway, she said that growing up in Mexico, they didn't have doctors like that. They didn't have choice medicines, supposedly. They had vegetables. They had roots. They had berries. And this was the, when, when they were sick, they did this. When they had a whatever, they ate this. And so that was, remember, that was God's whole thing. That was his original thing. You're to eat what you grow or what I grow for you. Because their priority was to please the king in heaven and did not worry about pleasing people or being popular, they ignored the urgings and threats of others and did that which God wanted them to do. Pleasing God first and foremost resulted in being elevated according to man's standard. Pleasing God first and foremost resulted in being elevated according to man's standard. When God revealed... Uh, yeah. 
That doesn't look right. I didn't think so. Then Nebuchadnezzar builds the image of himself on the plain of Dura. Many scholars believe this to be the same vicinity as where they tried, like again, we're going to bring up the Tower of Babel. It is important to note that the role of Babylon throughout Scripture, it is the first place where man attempted to unite the world under a single government and replace God with himself. Man replaced God with himself. With the Tower of Babel as recorded in Genesis but occurs yet again when the, lit when the literal historical Babylon and is recapulated yet again in the last days as described again in Revelation 16. Babylon, remember, Babylon represents sin. Always has, always will. Babylon represents sin. Babylon always stands for rebellion against the Lord an attempted substitute of what the Lord provides. There's so many substitutes uh, that are being tried to do for, uh, w that replace the Lord. Look at everything that goes on today. If, you, if, if you're one of those that even watches the news at all, and I'm not saying it's, you, you shouldn't because that's, that's a great, but we always see somebody is trying to replace God. In Genesis 11, we see Babel and rebellion against God in a human attempt at worldwide unity both politically and spiritually. This occurs again under Nebuchadnezzar and the establishment of his image. And it is the exact same thing attempted by the final person of the Antichrist in the last days when the material, culture, and religious system of the world are united under one world Federation. That, that word sounds familiar. You've heard that word pretty recently, a lot of times in the news. World, one world federation, one world order, one world church. Hmm. Yeah, the, I, I guess one, the, we will have a one world church someday, huh? but it's not going to be this one. It's going to be a shock to a lot of people. Babel literally means gate of God. So every version of Babylon is a counterfeit that pretends to be the way to heaven when the, in truth it's the way to hell. Yeah. When God revealed the content and meaning of Nebuchadnezzar's dream through Daniel 1 in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar paid homage to Daniel and stated, Surely your God is a God of gods and the Lord of kings. I, when I was reading this, I got to thinking, and I'm just a simple person, so I don't. when I think it doesn't mean a whole lot. But whenever you've probably watched a presidential speech on TV or anywhere, have you ever noticed that they end that speech by saying, God bless you and God bless America. They're doing the same thing as, uh, as Nebuchadnezzar. They're patronizing and giving you what you want to hear. Oh, he's a Christian. He said, God bless. No, no, that had nothing to do with it. And then I got to thinking further than that about my own life like that. How many times have we walk past somebody or greeted somebody, oh, how are you doing? God bless you, and just keep walking. How many times have we, have we said, oh, I'll keep you in prayer, and just keep walking? It's no different. We're patronizing, but we're not doing it. We're not doing it. He seemed, when he said this, surely your God is a God of is a God of gods and a Lord of kings. He seemed to acknowledge the sovereignty of one true God. Hmm. What is ironic is Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged God as Daniel's God, your God, but made no confession of faith that he himself now actually worshipped and followed God. In fact, 
since the golden head of the image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream was stated to represent Nebuchadnezzar himself, this most likely shows that he has come to the erroneous conclusion that he is, indeed, someone of such great standing that he is to be worshipped in a figure merely of gold and assembling, resembling only himself. That, my friend, is the Antichrist spirit. You know, growing up as a kid, I wasn't uh, privileged to really be a, a part of a church family. My, my family were from the, the hills of Arkansas in Oklahoma. And, of course, they had the, the Baptists were out there. They called them the Holy Rollers back then, the Holy Rollers. I, I never got to go to it. Thank, thank, thank you, Lord. But uh, the, the things I've heard them say, oh, yeah, all this. You think that uh, Bethel is bad. Some of the Holy Rollers were, had, a, had them beat by a long ways. But I was never privileged to, to know this I, until in 19, or not 19, in 2005 when I, be, when I came to the Lord and became part of God's family that I start really reading the Bible and learning. Wow. I used to come home a, a few months after, uh, or I mean, from work, after I'd been saved for a few months, I'd ask Carol, who's Michael the angel? God just showed me Michael the angel today. Who's Michael? Who is this person? Who's that person? And, and I never knew that. I wish that if I could go back in time, that I could have been a Christian all my life. But that, but that doesn't matter. I'm still saved. I'm still going to be there. But what if I hadn't? What if I had passed on when I was 40, 50, even 60? What if? Yeah, I would have lost it. I would have lost all of that. So Nebuchadnezzar got a big head, pride, Look, you know, Daniel's got a God, but I am the God. Daniel's God did this, did that, but I am the God that you need to bow down to. So I'm going to build myself an idol. And so he did. And he put it out in the, in, the, in, the, in the field, mountains, whatever, in the valleys. He put this uh, replica of him, the golden idol. And Daniel and, and his camaraderies, Meshach, Abednego, Shadrach, they said, we're not going to build bow down. We will not be doing that. You are, and... and uh, of course, his buddies of, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the ones that would lie and cheat and do everything to get ahead, it, even with each other. In Daniel 3, 8 to 12, let me just find that. We're talking about supposedly the friends of these boys. That, anyway, remember Daniel was only what fifteen years old when he was first taken into captivity, so they were young men. And it says, starting in verse eight, for this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar, the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the providence of Babylon, namely, you know, they throw them under the bus right here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you, 
They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. They were, they were the little tattletales. And like I say, they threw these three under the bus real fast. So Nebuchadnezzar had built himself an image of himself on the plain of Dured. And many scholars believed that this is the area of Babel. Why is Babel this important? Because Babel is sin. Babylon is sin. He built it right there. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? And in verse 16, they said, this says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you the an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnaces of the blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king, but even if he does not. Let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve our gods, your gods, or worship the golden image that you have set up. So what's the big deal? Can't you just, uh, about worship, could you just mutter some words and make everyone think that you're all happy though you don't believe it in your heart? Pay, pay homage to somebody that you just, that you know is a lie? God is a good God, but he's also a stern God, like it said. The biblical concept of worship means to serve. If you worship God, you serve God. If you worship Nebuchadnezzar, you serve Nebuchadnezzar, not the, not the true God. What is being required here is to stop serving the one true God and begin serving the false one in his place. This is a battle for the heart. So right now, so now might we characterize this response, rejecting the pressure to cause serving the true God, to, to seize serving the true God and serve another God. Rejecting the pressure. Yeah, it's just too much of a strain on me to, to stand up for God. What's he ever done for me? He didn't, again, he didn't give me all that stuff. He didn't take care of me. What did God give for you? He, he gave you a life forever. You just have to accept it. There, are certain, there were certain theologians from the old, and they put it this way. They would rather burn than turn. And that's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would rather burn than turn against God. They would rather devote their hearts to God. And if it goes, and they stated it back there earlier, if it goes, if we go into the furnace, the furnace, and we die, so be it. That was God's will. And think about this. You go in the, and, and I, hey, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's not going to feel good as we're going to go into this later. Uh, they understood that there is a very serious spiritual issue at stake here beyond just the persecution of their own faith. In verse 15, the king makes this statement. What God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Your God's not big enough to deliver you. He had elevated himself to the level of godhood in claiming there were no gods more powerful than him. 
This was not just a challenge to the young men's personal faith. It was a challenge against their entire faith in the Lord God Almighty himself. They recognized the king was given over to deception by this time. They did not respond with a theological debate or any kind of intellectual argument. The issue really comes down to a matter of faith. And therefore, the only appropriate response in such situations is faith. Do we realize that not everything requires intellectual response, like we said? How well do we recognize the times when what is most needed in the statement and display of faith is action? They didn't just use their mouth and pay lip service. They said, no, we will not go in there, and if need be, we will, we will commit ourselves to, to going into the, the fiery furnace. In verse 17 of uh, Daniel 3, it says, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the, fiery, from the blazing furnace, and he will deliver us out of the hands of you, O king. They had the assurance of what God had already done in the past, such things in the crossing of the Red Sea. Many times he saved Israel supernaturally, and so and keep on, we could keep on going. They knew from past precedents that God would choose to overcome any earthly situation. And, of course, they have the example of Job. They look back on Job. In Job 13, 15, it says, Though he slay me, I will hope in him. These were young men brought up by godly parents. They were being taught God's word. They should expect that persecution is inevitable. And if we're around when it, when it tongue gum time, we need to expect that too. We can't float off in a cloud and then and, and, uh, be happily ever after. There is going to be a time when there's going to be some type of persecution. And we're going to, those that are of us that are here, will, be, will have to go through it. They expect the persecution is inevitable. When it comes to persecution, what should Christians expect? It says in, in 1 Peter 12 to 14. First Peter 4, 12 to 14. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share and the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled, reviled, for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of, of the glory and God rest in you. Amen. And in John 15, Eight to twenty. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have loved you also. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be in me. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. For one, that one lay down his life 
for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you my friends, for all things I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would, be, would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. This is this I command to you, that you love one another. One aspect of persecution is having to make a personal stand against sin. That's hard, huh? I know when, when Anthony and Chris and, and Tony and the other people go out to Planned Parenthood, they have to make that stand. They make it whether they, what am I, I was going to say whether they want to or not, but they want to, but they have to make that stand. And all type, there's people that come against you, there's, there's people that spit in your face. There's people that yell at you. How might this conflict with today's pressure for Christians to stand up for political causes? And that's just what we were talking about. We had elections yesterday. It didn't go my way, but it went the Lord's way because he's the one that, that, that allows it to happen. Uh, every day when I get up, maybe not it's going my way, but it goes his way as long as you ask him and and, and repent and love him. So. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was altered towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded certain vigilant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and all of their other clothes, and they were cast into the midst of the fiery furnace. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was made extremely hot, the flame of the fire slew the men who, were, who carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the fiery furnace, blazing fire, still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to the high official, Was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Certainly, O king. And he said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking around in the midst of the fire. Do we have that? Yeah, there you go. In the midst of the fire. And, the, and one has the appearance of the fourth. Well, the fourth has the appearance of the Son of God's. Christ never leaves us. Even in the midst of the worst fiery trial, he is always right there beside us. Christ never leaves us when we're in the time of trouble. He's always there with us. This is God's promise. When you pass through the waters, this is in Isaiah. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched. Or will the flame burn you? Everything that the earthly king does is a counterfeit to this, ev to this event, has a true opposing as counterfeit in this event it has a true opposing action provided by the heavenly kings what so nebuchadnezzar's best match against god's best match nebuchadnezzar presents his false image but god provides the actual person of christ before everyone's eyes nebuchadnezzar institutes false worship but god demonstrates through the three men merely a true worship as with most things, it comes down to just test of faith of everyone involved. Winding up here. The way we face persecution has to do with testing our personal faith. As it does with placing our faith on display as a testimony to others, 
especially the ones persecuting us. It is in God's hands how he will still how he will use the circumstances not just to carry out his will, but to reverse Satan's intentions for the entirety for entirely different outcomes. They were actually better off for having gone through the fire because they had the opportunity to walk with Christ and suffer together with him. You ever thought about that when you, oh man, is that it? I got to go through that. But look, look at, look at wow, when they came out the other side. And I'm not saying that we're not going to get thrown into something and we die. That, that's, this was to make a point. God was making a point and, and then, uh, honoring their faith. But no matter if we were, if we were thrown into and we died, that's still standing up for our belief and standing up for God. And there'll be a lot of that probably in the end times. The fire actually set them free of the bonds in, in much of the same way that suffering of Christ results in liberty from sin in the world. They were a public testimony which glorified God before others. And finally, the king did not promote them, did not only promote them and give them honors, but he did the same for one true God they served. He did this. He promoted the one true God after that. Before the return of Christ, Christians may go through the fiery, fiery furnace. There's no need to fear. For Christ will never, ever, ever leave us. In fact, it is far better to go through the furnace of fire than to end up in the lake of fire. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you and we thank you that, that you have given us the words of, that you will be with us and you will take care of us. You do ask things in return, but that is to be faithful to you and to trust you and to love you and to love your neighbor. And to, and to not uh, turn against you. And Father, tonight we come to you and we ask that you bless us, you keep us safe and healthy. But we ask, Father, that you keep giving us that strength and wisdom to keep saying we love you. We want to do what you want us to do, Father. We come against the actions of the world because we are not of the world. We come against those actions, Father, and, and bow down to you and glorify you. If people come and see us in Father God and our actions are good, let it be. Let it be, Father, that those actions go out and, and tell others that you are the true and only God. So we thank you, Father, and we praise you, and we love you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.